Molly, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Hi, thank you for joining us today. I'm Molly Miller-Mons and I am the Interim Director of Philanthropy at the ACLU of Minnesota. I'm honored to welcome you to the third of four conversations where we, where we will explore the intersection between women's rights and racial justice. The series titled Advancing Women's Equality, Confronting Barriers to Full Inclusion and Progress has been designed and will be moderated by Professor Michelle Goodwin. Today's conversation will center on advancing women's equality, re reproductive health, rights, and justice. A nationally recognized advocate for civil liberties and civil rights, Professor Goodwin is the Chancellor's Chair in Law at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. She is an elected member of the American Law Institute, as well as an elected fellow of the American Bar Foundation. Her most recent book, Policing the Womb, Invisible Women and the Criminalization of Motherhood, is available at your local bookstore or library. Professor Goodwin serves on the Executive Committee and National Board of the American Civil Liberties Union and is a member of the ACLU of Minnesota's Board of Directors. For nearly 70 years, the ACLU of Minnesota has fought to protect the civil liberties of Minnesotans. We are a nonpartisan organization. Our client is the Constitution, not one particular political view. We have been fighting for reproductive rights since 1970 three years before Roe v. Wade, when we filed a complaint challenging the constitutionality of Minnesota's anti-abortion law, which prohibited abortion unless medically necessary. Dr. Janie Hodgson was indicted for the crime of providing a medically advised abortion. It was the first time in US history that a licensed physician had been charged for providing a medically approved abortion. She was sentenced to 30 days in jail and a year of probation. Her conviction was later overturned. Since then, we fought against annual assaults on reproductive rights. We fought bills that would have banned public funding for abortion, criminalized doctors for um, performing abortions, forced providers to collect and maintain our private data for 30 years, made doctors ask women to view ultrasounds before an abortion, and much more. We've joined in lawsuits to uphold our right to choose, and we fight alongside reproductive activists across the state to protect access. To learn more and to support the work of the ACLU of Minnesota, please visit our website, www.aclu-mn.org. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to um, Professor Goodwin for moderating this conversation. Oh, Ma, thank you so very much. For leadership and your great work with the ACLU of Minnesota, it's very much appreciated. Joining us today are Professors June Carbone, Professor Priscilla Ocean, Alana Odoms, who's the executive director of our sister organization, the ACLU of Louisiana, and also the Emmy Award uh, winning journalist and also director and filmmaker, Sivia Tamarkin. I couldn't be more honored and pleased to have in this conversation these dynamic individuals who really have helped to shape discourse in so many ways in uh, this domain. We're gonna get started first, seeing uh, a clip from Right War Story, which was directed by Sivia Tamarkin and really helps to set the stage for today's conversation. It is a very scary time in the United States right now for a woman to become pregnant. Every aspect is now being subject to state punishment, control, and surveillance. There's three officers. They wanted to know if I had an unlawful miscarriage. He's getting out the handcuffs. You have a warrant for your arrest. She was still bleeding from having the baby. We have to say that life begins at conception. Who speaks for the baby? We've been passing laws in state after state, and they think they're going to waltz in and just repeal them? It's not going to happen. The anti-choice movements, they have moved into positions of power. We did not see the onslaught that was coming. The last time this country dealt with an issue of this dynamic, we shot each other to doll rags. On the, on the Civil War battlefield. If a law had passed, it would be illegal to induce my pregnancy. I could have lost my love of my life. It was 10 days of torture. She didn't sign anything. 
What's going on here? How can they just be rolling her down the hallway into the operating room? The state has the right to intervene in a woman's life from the second she becomes pregnant. That's an intrusion in the life of an individual that should shock every true conservative in this country. Two to three women will die every day in the United States from pregnancy-related complications. In some states, it's safer for a woman to go and give birth in a developing country. I didn't want to have any more children. I had asked my doctor, can we go ahead and get my tubes tied? I was told no. There's a lot of people who just simply have no idea how horrific it has been. If we don't step in, all of these dominoes are gonna come down together. That's pretty powerful. The promise of Roe v. Wade in many ways seems a dream deferred or more elusive in the wake of Justice Ruth Ginsburg's passing. As you all know, she was a leader within the American Civil Liberties Union before being tapped to come into the federal bench. In 1973, in a seven to two decision, the Supreme Court decriminalized abortion, making it legal to terminate a plea. According to the court, the right to terminate pregnancy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty um, or in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, the court said it was broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, it's a powerful decision. Of those seven judges, justices, five were Republican appointed, which really sets the stage for where we are today. The court acknowledged that both mental and physical health could be taxed by childcare. And the court said bringing a child into a family already unable psychologically and otherwise care for it could be devastating. And that was nearly 50 years ago. Today, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg longer serves on the court and reproductive rights are more fragile than ever. And so I want to start off by turning to you, Sivia Tamarkin. That's your film, part of your film that we just saw. What was your inspiration for doing Birthright? Hello, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on this topic, which is so timely right now, given the fact that just yesterday, the state of Arizona, of Arkansas outlawed all abortions, except for the mother's life. Um, seems to be all of the A states moving ahead. I'm here in Arizona where I spent yesterday and Monday testifying virtually against some abusive legislation that's been proposed. But what has happened is I certainly was someone who was very active in the late 60s and in the early 70s and trying to get abortion legalized. And I began like so many other people of my generation, we thought we won. And we were not paying attention to the strategic maneuvering of the opposition, how they had laid out a plotted battle plan and were moving slowly and decisively with their eye on the prize. And so many of us thought that with all the decisions that had been made, even though there was some erosion, Casey versus Pennsylvania and so on, uh, restrictions on various limitations, parental rights demanded um, for a, a woman under age 18 and so on, we still thought that Roe was the law of the land. And what was my alarm was the Hobby Lobby decision. I found it incredulous that birth control, which prevented unwanted pregnancies, would suddenly be labeled an abortifacient. And I did not understand how this had happened. And so as a journalist, 
My goal in journalism throughout my career had been to connect the dots. And that's what I tried to do with Birthright. I did not want to do a film that was continuation of abortion stories. We have been telling abortion stories and the need for the absolute access to terminate a pregnancy for decades, starting in, in the 50s and 60s. And it has gotten us nowhere, frankly. So what I wanted to do was a film that showed the collateral damage from this war on reproductive health care and access to it and how the criminalization of pregnancy and how, um, has, has taken precedence and how every process, you know, we tend to frame the argument in terms of abortion, but these restrictive laws affect birthing as well and force cesareans and restrictions in terms of courts deciding when, how, and under what circumstances women will give birth. So I wanted to document how the opposition had gained this momentum and I wanted to sound the alarm for the younger generations, for my grandchildren's generation who really do not seem to realize that Roe for all intents and purposes exists in name only for most of the country. So I'd like to bring in here Professor Priscilla Ocean. And that is your work shows, your, your work speaks to reproductive justice. And appreciated if you could define what reproductive justice means and take up what, uh, what Sylvia has just been talking about, that it's not just abortion that happens to be at risk and at stake, but so much more. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think um, reproductive justice is an intersectional uh, framework that is inclusive of law, but not exclusive of law, that embraces social movements, that embraces public policy, uh, that embraces the lived experiences of the most marginalized women. And so a reproductive justice framework centers the experiences of women, girls, and femmes of color. And I think a basic um, way to articulate what reproductive justice is, um, is a framework that argues uh, that women, girls, femmes, inclusive of both cis and transgender women, uh, and people more generally, not just uh, women, have the right to make decisions about their reproductive capacities uh, to, as to whether to choose to have children or families or not, uh, and to be able to raise those families, those children themselves, uh, and, and to express themselves with safety and dignity to not only express themselves in terms of their reproductive capacities, but their sexual preferences, their gender identities. Um, it not only speaks to uh, negative rights, that is to say that the state should not uh, prohibit individuals from uh, um, uh, accessing abortion or contraception, right? Those, so that the state ought to uh, be excluded from those kinds of choices regarding reproductive capacities. But it argues that the state has an affirmative uh, obligation to ensure that individuals have access to the resources, the services, um, and institutions that they need uh, to make healthy choices, right? So to make choices real, we have to have resources, and the government has an obligation to ensure that people have access to resources to make choices about how they want to express themselves in terms of their sexuality, gender identity, and uh, their reproductive capacities. So how does this fit with your research then and the backdrop that Sivia was laying out, which is abortion is at stake and at, but what are some of the other types of issues that are on the horizon? So for example, for our audience, when our audience thinks about civil rights, they know that it didn't end with Brown v. Board of Education, right? There was desegregation of parks, desegregation of the busing, making sure that there's housing, making sure that there's employment access. Along the lines of reproductive rights, people tend to think, well, it's abortion as the Sylvia was mentioning, she became alarmed when it's contraceptions at stake. So what are some of the things that you say and you to know here are the things that are on the chopping block or what's happening to people who can yeah. become pregnant? 
Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I take a page from, from your important work, right? Policing the womb, reproductive profiling, um, uh, and thinking about the ways in which um, particularly uh, women of color, Black women, Indigenous, Latinx women are often discouraged um, from having families and children. We can talk about the long history in this country of chattel slavery, of the exploitation of Black women's uh, reproductive capacities, the regulation of Black women's reproductive choices following the abolition of slavery. We can talk about the systematic um, of child removal uh, of, uh, of, from uh, Indigenous communities as part of a project of assimilation, uh, systematic um, sterilizations of uh, women in uh, Puerto Rico, in Alabama, in Mississippi, right? So the project isn't just about uh, enabling women to make choices not to have children, which of course is a part of a longer history about uh, social constructs of gender, of sex, uh, obligations related to motherhood and so forth, which are which have been state imposed. That's certainly the case on the one hand, but there's also a history of uh, state suppression of the reproductive choices of uh, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx women, which is part and parcel to our expression of ourselves as as human beings. So, you know, I, the the clip mentioned this, but one is the criminalization of uh, women who are are birthing, um, who are alleged to have done something to harm. Uh, a fetal life. So, for example, by using uh, drugs or engaging in conduct that uh, they've been advised to avoid by their doctors. You can we can think about uh, the recent stories coming out of um, immigration and customs facilities where um, uh, immigrant women were forcibly sterilized. Right, this as part of a project of um, ethno-racial nationalism. Right, preventing um, people of color from becoming citizens and residents of this country to protect. Uh, um, this country's white identity. So there's a, a, a corollary history not a, a, of, of not only um, preventing women from making choices about whether they want to become mothers by prohibiting abortion, by prohibiting contraception, but there's also a history of preventing women who wish to become mothers uh, from having children through forced sterilization, through child removal policies, and through uh, essentially systematic racism, police violence. I could talk about the way in which <laughs> is a major issue related to reproductive justice and reproductive capacity. Um, so there are a lot of things on the table at the moment that are linked to questions of abortion, contraception. It's a part of a broad spectrum about the basic ability to make choices about how we want to be in the world, uh, what kind of roles we want to play, how we want to express ourselves sexually, and how we want to um, utilize our reproductive capacity. So that the real critical question is choice and agency right. and resources. Well, and, and Alana, your important work in Louisiana ties in here. So if we're continuing to stitch the thread together, the Supreme Court very recently took up a case that was from Louisiana. Um, the June medical case involved the state of Louisiana putting forward basically the same as it had been struck down um, several years before um, coming out of this. Tell us a little bit about and about the work that you all are doing in Louisiana with reproductive health rights and justice? Sure. So first, I just want to say I'm so grateful to be here and have the opportunity to hear from such incredibly powerful leaders uh, in this space. Um, Priscilla and also uh, Sivia. Gosh, just such amazing work. And I, and I just feel really honored. Um, also, Michelle, it's just incredible to be in your presence as well. Um, so the June Medical Services case, I'll just start by telling you, June Medical Services is uh, an abortion clinic in Shreveport, Louisiana. And it's uh, one of uh, only four abortion clinics in the entire state of Louisiana. And um, the, the special thing about this uh, United States Supreme Court case is that there was a case uh, just four years before in Texas uh, that was exactly the same, exactly the same. And the only difference was the composition of the court um, looked different. And so just to Sivia's point about the really incredible um, strategic planning and um, strategy that has been taken on by uh, the conservative uh, right uh, to really look to um, push abortion care out of reach, but to time it and to really look at how 
um, state legislatures can really look to, to, um, um, to really restrict the rights of women and access to abortion care. So essentially this is a trap law. So the trap laws are essentially not speaking directly to abortion care, but putting obstacles and barriers in place uh, in order to prevent women from accessing care. So this was um, an admitting privileges law, which essentially says that, you know, a physician that uh, performs abortions has to have admitting privileges at a hospital um, in order to ensure the safety and care of people receiving abortions. Well, uh, in uh, the Texas law from four years before, the court found that this admitting privileges law had nothing to do with the health and safety of the mother and essentially was just an obstacle. It it's essentially was calling it pretextual. This is really not about health and safety of women. Abortion care is safe. This is not about the need for a woman to be hospitalized. In fact, uh, 70,000 uh, abortions had been performed at June Medical Services Clinic and only four individual cases had ever required hospitalization. So it was clear on the face of this that um, we weren't speaking about safety. And so we're relieved, of course, that the court uh, and the chief justice uh, essentially tipping the, the odds in favor of the liberal majority was able to up, you know, uphold the decision. Um, but for us in Louisiana, I, I think you know, it was, it's really a pyrrhic victory, if you will, because we're still facing, just as so many other states around the nation are, uh, so many attacks on um, the fundamental right to abortion, but also to healthcare in the state of Louisiana for women. And so um, uh, folks on the line may know this, but there was a constitutional amendment that passed uh, just this uh, past legislative session that uh, affirmatively removed any state right to abortion. Um, but also uh, even prior to the passage of this amendment, um, there was already a trigger law in place that would make abortion illegal in the state of Louisiana if uh, Roe was ever overturned. So the constitutional amendment was more um, just cementing the, the idea that the, the Supreme Court could in no way interpret any aspect of our constitution to support health care and the right to access abortion. And so there, this is a very, very, very serious problem, especially in a state where we find uh, black maternal mortality to be as high or if not higher than many other uh, states in the nation, uh, particularly for women of color and uh, Latinx women and um, indigenous women in the South. Healthcare is incredibly difficult to access, incredibly difficult. And then the last thing I'll say is we have an incredible problem with detention. Uh, obsession with mass incarceration of our own citizens, but also of immigrant populations in the state of Louisiana. On any given day, there are 15,000 folks detained, mostly in very rural areas and parishes where people have no idea that they're being housed there. Many of the folks who are being detained are pregnant women, and they are being denied healthy food. They are being denied uh, um, um, uh, sanitary items, they're being denied hygienic items, they're um, essentially being poisoned with some of the food, some of the cases that we're looking at, there's just uh, the, the most basic um, needs are not being met, and their voices are also being silenced. So a lot of our work at the ACLU of Louisiana, I say that we refract all of our work through a lens of racial and gender justice. So when we look at a First Amendment case, which we're looking at right now with five women who are in an immigrant detention facility, we are looking at how their First Amendment rights are being suppressed, how their reproductive liberties are being uh, suppressed, and how uh, those things really always typically run along a line of um, impacting more disparately <clears throat> Black and Brown indigenous women. So racial and gender justice lens on everything that we do. Um, so if, if I could, just in terms of adding the health piece here, which is that there's maternal mortality in the very states where there have been the attacks on abortion rights and access to contraception. Louisiana and Texas are considered the earliest places in the developed world for a person to be pregnant. The United States ranks somewhere around 50th, 51st, in the world in terms of maternal safety. Uh, it's healthier safer to give Saudi Arabia or in Bosnia than it is in the United States. And one but track that the states where it's the deadliest 
happen to be in the states where they're in most uh, vicious, some might say. June Carbone has joined us. So June, uh, in your work, you've studied red state, blue state, um, before talking about, you know, one of the things we've talked to people go across state lines to be able to have reproductive access. But before we do, can you tell us a little bit what you found in red states, blue states, in just terms of what's happening in red states, in terms of wedlock, births, pregnancies, all of that? Sure. And this is a huge topic, but I, I want to emphasize a couple of things. The first is that abortion was used to lock in the current Republican Party. It was a marker of identity. And the really extraordinary things that happened were over the course of the 90s and the 2000s. So if you go to, if you go all the way back to Roe, in the 70s, abortion was not a partisan issue. It was a Catholic Protestant issue. And the moral majority didn't want, to, you know, it was the Baptists were mildly pro-choice because they didn't want to be in the same boat with the Catholics. That began to change in the 80s. And in the 90s, what you see is a shift, a deliberate shift activated by Republicans, where people who were pro-life for religious reasons became more Republican. But during the Bush era, W, um, people who embraced a conservative Republican identity became reflexively anti-abortion even if they weren't religious at all, or they belonged to a church that was not anti-abortion. And if you ask what was happening, and you think about our current politics, part of what abortion did was part of the Republic, a deliberate Republican strategy of activating cultural identities where the people with the least tolerance for ambiguity, the greatest regard for hierarchy, for absolutism in beliefs, and for the kind of hierarchy that links to racism and authoritarianism. Embrace the Republican Party with abortion becoming the symbol of that move. And so when you think of a culture war, and you think of red states versus blue states, and you think of an ideological mindset, abortion was an effective activation of a set of personality characteristics associated with hierarchy over equality and authoritarianism over democracy. And well, you know, actually, June, just on that point, and then I'd love for you to tell us about what you found in those red states, but Prescott Bush, the father mm -hmm. of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. And it yeah. was H.W. Bush who shepherded Title X through Congress, which provided reproductive health care for the poorest Americans. And that was signed into law by Richard Nixon. And when Richard Nixon was asked about it, he said it's basic and sense reproductive health care. Yes. And, you know, my cousin, so my, my first cousin was the majority leader of the state Senate New York as a Republican when Mario Cuomo was governor. And his mother was the most religious member of our Catholic family. Um, and he used to say, you know, I hated abortion as a political issue because there was nothing to be done about it. It was testifying. You know, which side are you on? That's what people want to know. Um, and it is heavily Catholic um, constituency. It was, a, it was a, a fraught issue. But he felt the point of being in politics was to get stuff done. There was nothing to be done about abortion. It was to be on one side or the other of the issue. And that was its advantage as a political marker. So if you start with that, then I tend to add the second piece which is what has happened to reproductive rights by class over time. So again, go back to the beginning of the 90s and you see a huge shift between the early 90s and 2008, women who are 100% or more, I think it's 200% or more of the poverty line, their unintended pregnancy rate falls in half. Women who are below the poverty line experience a fairly dramatic increase in unintended pregnancies. And what's interesting is that while poorest women have the fewest abortions, 
well-off women have the largest number of abortions as a percentage of unintended pregnancies. And this corresponds with what is really a shift in mindset during that period. So when you go back, and this is roughly the period again from the early 90s through 2008, things change after 2008, and I'm going to get to it. And in that period, and I was living out in California, you know, my daughter uh, chose to tell me about what happened to all her friends. This is everything I know about the modern generation. And one of the shifts is that as contraception becomes more widely available, well-off women go on the pill at like 13, 14. And why? I, I, I had to go to Europe. I had somebody from Holland tell me about this. I'm too old to know these things. Uh, but it turns out doctors, if you go to a doctor, doctors start prescribing the pill routinely. When girls hit adolescence to deal with acne, menstrual cramps, things that have nothing to do with sex. And my daughter, who was working uh, in the school doing counseling, she said, oh yeah, she and her friends all went down to Planned Parenthood and got on the pill. Why? Because they were afraid they might be raped. And I thought, this is the weirdest thing. I mean, she's afraid somebody's going to jump out of the bushes. No, the, there's all this counseling about uh, acquaintance rape and how you should be prepared and how should you should be on the pill before you so, so are June, about being sexually active. And it's a one of the gift. So, so part of what we get from your research is that you find in the state where... Um, higher levels of um, pregnancies out of wedlock, higher rates of divorce, the kinds of things that don't kind of fit that kind of model of what people presume coming from the more kind of states. What I'd like to do is sort of turn this conversation back around to sort of race and also to economics as well. You know, one of the ways there have been the attacks uh, on reproductive rights to say, that, well, really abortion itself is a form of genocide against Black people, or that it's a means of undermining uh, Black women and women of color, their productive rights. And so a lot of if you could speak to, because some of that is coming out of, um, it's coming out of Louisiana. It's also coming out of Arizona too, Sylvia. So I'd love it if you could speak to that as well. So, but Alana, I'll start yeah. with you. But yeah. can I, can I, Michelle, but can I just finish? Because I, sure. you asked is what I was getting to. And I, I don't want to leave out the second half. So uh, for elite women, contraception becomes routine and abortion becomes an embarrassment because it means you weren't careful, which is not true in my generation. My generation, if you're sexually active, you got pregnant. And about 50% of the women I knew who were pregnant, uh, who were sexually active had abortions. Not true of the current generation. But what's the other half of that equation? Is the ability to get contraception disappears, especially for undocumented aliens and for many immigrant women. They drive this huge increase in unplanned pregnancies in the 2000s. And that, and abortion effectively disappears as a mean, means of birth control uh, with a stigma against it in poor communities. So when you look, and Michelle has written wonderfully about this, and you look at poorer women, poor women, in fact, the majority of women having abortions now already have children, and the poor women having abortions are much more likely to be having abortions because they already have two or three children. And it's an act of desperation, given their inability to deal with things. And if you look at the history of the Affordable Care Act and the undermining of provisions that would make it easy to provide contraception not abortion, contraception, or sterilization following a third pregnancy. And that then drives this increase in numbers. Sorry, I just wanted to get that in. <laughs> I'm really Anna, grateful for that. that thanks, thanks, June. Um, so I'll say one of the things that's particularly complicating in the narrative that you've shared, Michelle, is that um, the legislator that introduced the constitutional amendment and also the abortion ban is a black woman who's a Democrat. Her name is Katrina Jackson and very esteemed member of the black caucus, um, very well regarded 
um, attorney and community leader, if you will. And so I think we have to be really careful when we look at only, um, you know, thinking about the conservative right and thinking about, um, you know, legislators or lawmakers that look uh, a certain way or have a certain genotype or phenotype only and understand how insidious um, racial and gender discrimination is in the fact that we can be co-opted into using the same really um, nefarious way of describing what's going on, um, you know, in terms of Black women's rights being um, abridged or in some way um, impacted um, by the proliferation of abortion. And so, I mean, really, when you're talking about where Black women's rights are being most abridged is, you know, look at the rates of incarceration of Black women and Black pregnant women. Look at the rates of removal of children from Black mothers in the foster care system. Look at Black female mortality rates. Look at the rates of women being incarcerated, um, immigrant women. Really, this, this question, so if you look at this in a snapshot at conception, if you will, but then you, 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 you can be really confused. But if you look at the continuum of life and what we're actually talking about, where women's rights are being impacted, especially if you're going to talk about Black women, you have all these other points on this continuum where you can say, absolutely, this is, this is completely misguided, misdirected. Priscilla, did you want to add on there? Because Sylvia, right in your state right, right. is where there's also race-based anti-abortion legislation. Yes, I would like to say that we have to look at this in the broader context. And, and I have been arguing that now for for number of years, that we have to stop talking about reproductive rights and see everything within the framework of reproductive justice and the intersectionality of racism, sexism, and classism. But it is dominated by, and we cannot lose this perspective, it is dominated by a religious perspective. And that is the tool that the opposition has seized upon. So we see it in the broader context, the attempt to have the you know, religious freedom restoration act insidiously inserted into so much legislation. We really find ourselves on the road to Gilead now with an attempt to create a theocratic legislative body in most states. So for example, in Arizona, and we have an onslaught of dangerous and insidious laws here that will restrict not just reproductive access to reproductive health care, but transgender rights, LGBTQ plus rights. And it is done within a theocratic context. And I will say that we have a bill here that is destined, it was drafted intentionally to go directly to the Supreme Court because the preamble to this bill states that the unborn child at every stage of development will be deemed to have the same rights, protections, and privileges under Arizona law as anyone else, subject to Supreme Court interpretation of the Constitution. This is a law that has Black men's decision written on the nose cone of this rocket. And this is an attempt to undo um, you know, the row uh, majority opinion there. But it is done in consort with what we're seeing is the collaboration, we saw it in January 6th, between the Christian militia, the white supremacists and the anti-abortionists. They are an alliance, a holy alliance, if you will, that in the name of religion and protecting the unborn have unleashed unbelievably racist, sexist, and classist attacks. 
And so I just would like to add that one of the approaches that strategically we are doing here is we are departing from the usual strategy of, of course, defending a woman's right and to make her own decisions. We are now attacking these bills on First Amendment grounds that they violate the Establishment Clause of freedom of religion because they are an attempt to enshrine one religious view into law. For example, Judaism does not recognize personhood until birth. And there are other Christian denominations as well that do not. So what we have done here strategically is we are, we've decided to attack them on their own turf. We're going to throw religion back at them and tell them, wait a minute, you are discriminating against other religious points of view. And to that end, we have a letter written by cross-section of clergy representing various denominations that we are publishing. We're taking out space. We're publishing it in the local news. We're trying to get it up on billboards. But we decided to attack with a different strategy this time. So, you know, this brings to mind questions with regard to culture. What are the kinds of cultures that allow for the kinds of conditions that we see today and the ways in which all women are implicated and particularly women of color and black women? So I want to turn back to you, Priscilla, to just do some letting with regard to that, because it's easy to uh, forget and just think that these are issues of today. And it's important to be reminded that if you happen to be a woman of color, if you happen to be indigenous, you happen to be a black woman, there's a continuum. It's actually hard to find the spot where there was actually a break, uh, where there was humanity, dignity, the state saying we recognize the pains, the problems, the complicity of the past, and now we reform. So can you get some lessons in that regard? Yeah, so I, I think I think you know you're you're uh, being kind when you're saying it's hard to find uh, such a such a time. There is there has not been such a time uh, for for Black women, for Indigenous women, for Latinx women when our humanity uh, has been recognized, where the dignity uh, of our existence has been celebrated, or when we have been free to make unfettered choices about our bodies. Um, and so that is the project of abolition for Black women, for Indigenous women, for Latinx women, for Black feminism, right? The idea of bodily integrity and bodily autonomy from the moment we set foot or were brought to this country, that has been the central um, organizing principle of the work of the literature coming out of Black feminist theory, of uh, third world women's associations and formations it's about reclaiming ownership of our bodies. And I want to sort of pivot to the conversation about how the right has co-opted the critiques of Black feminists, the critiques of Indigenous uh, women, the critiques of Latinx women of um, genocide. And that is true, right? Black women, Indigenous women, Latinx women, have been targeted for sterilization, for population suppression efforts as part of an idea uh, uh, that's informed by eugenicism, eugenicism, for example, white supremacy, that to be American, to be a, a citizen of the United States is synonymous with whiteness. And in order to perpetuate that myth, um, the state has leveraged its power and its violence um, and directed it toward Black women, Indigenous women, Latinx women through systematic rape and abuse, through systematic child removal, through systematic sterilization. So that is a true history. And I think we actually do a disservice when we suggest that, that Black women or women of color are being duped in some way by critiques of the state and their and, and the attempts of the state to suppress uh, Black women, Latinx, Indigenous women's reproductive capacity. That is the truth. The problem is that we have not, as a movement, as a reproductive rights movement, effectively grappled with that history and message and connected with women of color around that legacy and developed effective legal strategies to combat 
how removal, sterilization, incarceration, abuse of uh, incarcerated uh, uh, people in women's facilities, shackling and so forth. And so because there is that vacuum, the right has parachuted in and attempted to message to communities of color this conservative message as part of a broader effort to, again, subordinate, suppress um, uh, whole communities, but particularly through the guise of uh, gender. So I think it's important to recognize it, but it's also important to note that Black women have seen through uh, the disingenuous attempts, and they have been able to hold these two things um, at the same time, right? That the core issue is about bodily integrity. It's about choice and self-ownership. So that means that we can criticize both attempts to um, suppress access to abortion and contraception, while at the same time using the same critique and the same framework to attack attempts to um, undermine the ability of Black women, uh, and so I'm here speaking to Black women, to have healthy, safe pregnancies and to be able to raise their children in homes that are safe, with an adequate income, with access to health care and employment, where they're not being underpaid and where they're not being abused by the police. So Black women have a comprehensive framework for understanding what reproductive justice is because that has been the central um, uh, that has been the central claim we have made in the state is that we own ourselves. Well, you know, on that note, I'm reminded of Sojourner Truth and the speech that people call "Ain't I a Woman" from the 1800s, and many people think speech according to chivalry because she does say that no one opens up a carriage door for her. But what I find interesting that's missed. And over a century of quoting this speech, over a century and a half, is that she said, and I bore 13 children and nearly each one snatched from my own, and nobody heard my cry but God, ain't I a woman? And it's a piece that's missed, but that's like forefront of her speech. My children were taken away from me and nobody heard. And all that I could do is cry out to the universe and only hear echo the space of that. I invite our audience to send up questions. We have a question in the chat which relates to the uh, statistics on maternal mortality and infant mortality. Um, I'd invite you all to, I will say that um, as I've talked about maternal mortality uh, for black women in this country, they're nearly four times more likely to die during childbirth and delivery than are their white counterparts. And that is magnified even more. That's a national statistic. Once you get to Alana's neck of the woods, parts of Louisiana or parts of Mississippi, it can be 10 times as many, 17 times as many Black women dying during childbirth and delivery than their white counterparts. Does anybody else want to add to um, the statistics there just in terms of the disparities, disparities experienced by women of color compared to their white counterparts? So one of the, I'll just add this in terms of um, sort of connecting different frameworks. Uh, so one of the projects that I'm working on is a, is a project called Black Feminist Abolition. Um, because I think we need to understand that police violence is gender violence, that racial justice is reproductive justice, and that abolition is a feminist project that advances reproductive justice. And I wanna tell the story of a woman who, who filed suit against um, a San, San Leandro Creek Police Department uh, here in California quite recently, just last year, she filed a federal civil rights lawsuit. And the central allegation was that um, when she was confronted, a police officer stopped her for baseless reasons. Um, she was pregnant at the time. The officer wanted to ask her a series of questions, you know, about what she was doing and why and so forth. And of course, she got uh, um, upset, you know, why am I being stopped? Uh, the officer escalated the situation, ended up throwing her to the ground. Um, uh, she thinks she was something like six or seven months, seven months pregnant. And she lost her pregnancy as a result of that assault. And I could tell you a number of other stories just like this where, where pregnant Black women are abused by the state or pregnant women are taken into custody. A Latinx woman out of Arizona um, sued uh, Maricop Mar uh, uh, Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio at the time for taking her into custody and shackling her when she went into labor, right? So the criminal legal system 
is a, 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 a an art is is a is a is an institution that is engaging in wholesale systematic reproductive abuse. And so when we think about that, I, I, I want us to really just make that connection in terms of the outcomes that Black women experience, particularly when they have contact with the carceral state. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because um, your work on shackling of uh, pregnant uh, women during, um, during childbirth and delivery um, in prison, even when that's not supposed to happen, um, it, it's critical. And there's so much more. It actually makes me think also about the state of Minnesota is one of four states that passed laws that were during the height of the 1980s and 90s, kind of euphemistically called crack baby mama's laws um, that provided but for the uh, compulsory civil incarceration of women who were thought to be unfit in carrying their uh, pregnancy. Uh, Wisconsin also had such a law. And Minnesota has now removed a law that allowed for black box shackling, which meant shackling a pregnant woman at her ankles, around her uh, waist and her wrists, all while pregnant. I mean, you just can't kind of make up that barbary, uh, that barbaric kind of sense of things. Uh, we have a question that's come up, which is, what is a good way to follow the legislative changes that are occurring that affect reproductive justice? Um, would you like to speak to that, uh, Alana, Sivia, uh, June? How do they follow the legislative changes? Well, there are several ways. One is to monitor at your state level what is happening through the legislatures now. There are postings of bills as they come up for hearings. You can go to your state legislative dot gov, whatever your state may be, see what the bills are. You can sign in to request to speak in many cases, and you can follow the bills. There are also aggregate um, groups, civic engagement beyond voting, progressive turnout, a number of organizations that monitor the bills in various states. And it's really important to note that most of these bills are disguised. So they are, as has been the topic uh, during much of the morning, they are disguised under protecting health. They are disguised as benefiting children. And in fact, it is a backdoor way of attacking access to reproductive health care. So there's another question that has surfaced. Uh, it's an interesting question about how we interpret reproductive uh, laws. Can oppressive reproductive laws be considered forms of political oppression and suppression as well? June, you're nodding. And so are you, Alana. I, I, I think there is absolutely no question that when I look at the political movement on these issues over time, that you have uh, a set of laws that basically, hey, wealthy people, you just hop on a plane and go to a different state. Poor people, you're really stuck. And I would say in the same way that um, the bad laws are disguised, sometimes the good laws are disguised. I went to a talk on Obamacare, not really about race, not really about women's reproductive rights, but the sleeper announcement was the single most dramatic change after the implementation of Obamacare is a drop in the deaths in black boys under the age of five. Nobody thinks Obamacare to that. I think there's all the sleeper stuff and that really seeing what's going on. The other piece I wanted to add is uh, take a look at interstate travel. States that have been attempting to ban abortion have also been trying to criminalize going across state lines. New Hampshire did it. If, if a guy takes uh, an underage woman across state lines to have an abortion, there's an effort to criminalize that. There is supposed to be a right to travel. My prediction is the Supreme Court will repeal it. All right. We're coming towards the end of our program and we could add an extra hour on it, just continuing along these lines. Let me just say that one of our uh, viewers has also said that 
reproductive justice organizations are tracking uh, these uh, oppressive uh, state laws that would seek to undermine uh, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey. But before we conclude, I'd like to ask each of our panelists um, if there's a silver lining somehow that they can see coming forward. Um, and if there isn't, why? I'll start with you, Cindy. I think that what we need to do is go back to the drawing boards here and we have to begin to look at a new strategy. Again, as we have reiterated, criminal justice reform, access to reproductive health care, racial injustice, it is all intersectionality. Mm -hmm. But each movement seems to be isolated. And so there is power in numbers, there is power in alliances. And we need to move together because what we always lose sight of is that the opposition here, the antis have put aside their values, have put aside their individual morality because as I said earlier, they keep their mm -hmm. eye on the price and they have formed all kinds of alliances in order to achieve their goal. We need to move together. We need to realize economic justice is part of the equation. And we need to begin acting. I mean, I we're out here on the front lines in a state like Arizona. We would welcome, frankly, a national economic boycott of corporations, <laughs> of tourism to begin to put pressure on these states. The same with other states that think that they have absolute impunity from passing these laws. So I think that we need, the silver lining is we know how to do it. We have seen okay. this happen in the wake of the atrocities that have been perpetuated by police brutality. We have seen people move for reform, but we don't see that same movement. We talk, but we don't see the same movement in terms of women's bodily autonomy. So we need to join forces. I'm going to quickly go to June, then Priscilla, and then close out with Alana. So uh, quick order, June, silver lining? Well, the silver, silver lining is, you know, we've had 30 years of effectively taking away women's reproductive issues, and no one notices when it's poor minority women. Uh, interfere with elite women's ability to do whatever they want, and Mississippi uh, defeated a person that amendment at the polls because it threatened IVF. We have to see this as broader and we have to hit people where it hurts. Thank you, June. Priscilla. So I am optimistic uh, or so I have so I see a silver lining because of people like Stacey Abrams, uh, because of people yeah. like Patrice Cullors and Alicia Garza um, who are powerful advocates for racial justice for reproductive justice and who connect up um, movements uh, related to police violence, justice reinvestment, and the impact of state violence on, on Black women, girls, and femmes. So uh, I see a silver lining because I trust and believe in the power of Black women to transform this country. And then Alana, I'd love to wrap up uh, with you. And for those of you who are still putting questions to us in uh, the chat, I will share that with my colleagues uh, here and we'll try to respond to you. All right, Alana. So um, I just want to um, double click on Priscilla's comment and to offer that before Sojourner Truth gave her in I a woman's speech, she actually uh, addressed the audience and said to the group that if the first woman that God ever made was powerful enough to turn the world upside down, then all of these women here working together have the power to turn it right side up again. I will leave you with that. <laughs> that is such a powerful point on which to leave us. Um, Audience, I hope you will join me in thanking such a spectacular group of individuals today who joined us, who are part of the nation's most robust leadership 
in this domain. Thank you so much for joining us at the AC of Minnesota and also our collaborators and partners in lifting up and thinking about reproductive health rights and justice in advancing women's equality. This is such an important time in our nation's history to continue pushing dialogues and discourse about matters such as this. And I'm happy that we could present this kind of program to those of you who are in Minnesota and across the country who care about these issues. Wishing you all great rest of your day. For those of you who want to start this work, then please put in the chat really quickly how you can support you of Minnesota. The ACLU, this helps to continue to further the kind of advocacy that you heard about today. Thank you.